My name is Jack Pride and uh, I'm going to take you on to a Heritage New Year walk. Virtually, that is, this year because of the health situation. But in 1985, the Dunfermline Heritage Guides were formed by the Carnegie Trust. And I was one of the first guides to sign up and qualify. In January 1986, we started the first New Year walk. And uh, ever since, we've had a New Year walk on the 2nd of January around Dunfermline. This year, we can't, but I'm going to take you on a wee virtual walk to show you some of the highlights of Dunfermline. I'm standing right in front of the uh, Glen Gates, or the gates to Pittencreef Park, as some people refer to it. <clears throat> and this, of course, enters into the lands of Pittencreef, private estate for centuries. And then on the 27th of December, 1902, Andrew Carnegie, Dunfermline's famous, famous son, he actually bought the property for about £45,000 and immediately opened it up to um, all the public and citizens of Dunfermline. A couple of wee points. LC and AC is obviously Andrew Carnegie and Louise Carnegie, his wife. Louise Whitfield Carnegie, an American lady he married over in New York. But let's take a wee walk up into the park, which was a great gift that Andrew gave his town. Just over to my left, you can see uh, the dovecot of the estate. This was a uh, a legal requirement in days gone by that every private estate had to have a place for their pigeons uh, to live. If I was owner here and one of my pigeons flew into another farmer's fields and did damage, that farmer could actually come with the pigeon and hand it over to me to ask me to repair. But if it wasn't my pigeon, I would just tell them, sorry, that's not my pigeon. And that's where we get that the well-known phrase that we sometimes, sometimes do today. But just in front of it, you can see a, a small mound running quite a few feet. And that was below there is a public air raid shelter from the Second World War. Um, hopefully someday we're going to open up just over there I'd open up on that end and try and just see what is there, if there's anything left at all. But uh, just one of these wee things that you pass every day, you never see. Walking up the pathway to Carnegie statue, I can highlight this little uh, plaque here, Vartan's Way. Um, that's in uh, recognition of a Vartan a Gregorian the 12th president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York for his contribution to international philanthropy in 2013. I was here the day that all the crowds were here and uh, it was unveiled. The Vartan was here as well, but uh, I didn't realize it was so many years ago. Seven years ago, goodness gracious. And here is the statue of the Laird of Pittencreef, Andrew Carnegie. Um, <clears throat> Andrew left on family, we'll be talking about him later on in the tour, but Andrew left here in 1835 with his family. They were penniless, they went to America, and the original rags to riches story came with Andrew rising to the richest man in the world. In 1914, uh, the early part of 1914, they decided to put this statue here. 
the park already was open to the town in 1902, so they decided to... But this is a very rare um, statue. It was subscribed to by the people of Dunfermline. They actually put their hands in their pockets and paid for it themselves. And uh, all the whole town was here the day that uh, it was unveiled. Andrew himself was not, sadly. He was probably up in Skeeble Castle, up north. You'll notice that uh, I'm walking rather gingerly. Um, this would not be a 2nd of January tour or a 2nd of January walk uh, without having ice as minimum. Normally it could be snow, it could even be rain, but it's always definitely cold. Now just behind me, um, this rather new looking building um, is of course the headquarters of the Carnegie Dunfermline Trust, also the headquarters of the United Kingdom Trust and also the headquarters of the Scottish Universities Trust, all funded by Carnegie money. Over here on my right, you'll see a swing park uh, for children playing on. Um, one of the benefits that Carnegie personally wanted to bring to children in Dunfermline was that this would be a place of relaxation, of playing, so they could come and enjoy themselves. There's been several play parks. The one is just over there um, at the bottom of the hill which was superseded by this one here and then I think it was 2003 that this one was opened um, by Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, we were very fortunate I was one of the invitees um, to go for lunch with the Queen in the pavilion. <clears throat> As you go through the, uh, the glen, over here is the known as the Glen Pavilion. Um, there's been several tea houses and restaurants over the years. Um, I you know, some photographs we have as of record. Um, the bigger part is the, uh, the dance hall, the, the big public hall where you can have dances, conferences, etc. But also there is an outside stage um, where from many years ago we used to have you know, famous bands, military bands mainly, they came and they played for the entertainment. Over here to my left, there is what they call the Italian Gardens. Uh, this was created um, around about the 1920s when the stables of the estate used to be here. But like many, many other things in Dunfermline, all suffered from being uh, burnt down. So this lovely landscape. It's not quite in the same condition these days, but uh, it's still very nice. Um, and behind me here is the, the main pavilion and the Peacock Restaurant, a recent addition um, you know, by, donated by the Carnegie Trust and built a few years ago. <clears throat> and there you can see the rather impressive front facade of the Carnegie uh, Pavilion down in the Glen. The tea rooms were here and, and when they were first started the tea rooms were just the place to be. You had to book a table for Saturday lunch and the pavilion further on. <clears throat> and just behind me there, this pole standing in the garden is the Peace Pole. It was, it was uh, unveiled by the Dalai Lama uh, a few years ago when he visited the, uh, the town. Now this here is the uh, Dunfermline's answer to Doctor Who 
and his TARDIS. Um, it might could be a TARDIS, but it's not. It was the original telephone box in the town, or in the park here. But it's not used anymore, but we can't remove it because it's got, it's a listed building. Um, so it's a wee bit of uh, history, again, unusual history of Dunfermline. Here we have the mansion house of the estate. <clears throat> all the lairds who owned the estate all stayed there at one time or another, building an extension every change of laird. However, when Andrew Carnegie um, bought the estate, he did not become a living in laird of Pitton Creef. But what he did do, he gave the bottom floor, the ground floor, that was gifted to the old men of Dunfermline to have as a club where they could go in and, and uh, read the papers, play dominoes, reminisce, etc. <clears throat> and also, I had the privilege when I was a young, much younger man, I used to be an electrician in the town and we went in there to do work. And the first thing we had to take is a hacksaw to cut our way through the tobacco reek. It was really thick tobacco reek. But that was, it's no longer the old man's house, but, and it's all closed at the moment, but we believe there are development plans for it, and uh, it would be good to see it reused. But one of the lairds, the owners of the t park, was a family called Forbes, and they um, hailed from Edinburgh, but they came here <coughs> And this one of the sons, John Forbes, um, was a military man and he went off to America with the British forces and he fought against the uh, Indians and the French. And his claim to fame is marked here on this marker, <laughs> that he went from uh, Philadelphia all the way across and went to a place called Fort Duquesne. Um, fought the French there and he won. So um, what they decided to do was they couldn't call a British uh, site now, Duquesne, they called it Fort Pitt after um, William Pitt, Prime Minister. Um, Pitt grew and grew and grew and then it became Pittsburgh. And then about 100 years later, in 1835, young Andrew Carnegie, another boy from Dunfermline, came and took on the Dunfermline connections with Pittsburgh. So there are quite a few connections with Pittsburgh and at Dunfermline. right in the very epicentre of the Glen. Um, Pittencreef Estate, Pittencreef Park, all these names, but most people just know this as the Glen. It has been known as this for centuries. You'll hear the, in the background the rippling water from the waterfall, and behind me through the trees, which you'll see shortly, Malcolm's Tower, or the base of Malcolm's Tower. Malcolm III came here around about 1058 <clears throat> and he built a defensive tower so he could spy out all his uh, enemies. And that's how Dunfermline got his name. There was no Dunfermline here before the tower because you have a, a dun, which is a fortified hill, and firm means crooked or bent, and that refers to that river you can hear and possibly see as it makes its way round the hill. And lynn, pools and cascades of water. And you can listen to the, one of the cascades even today. 
So that is where Dunfermline was actually founded, way back in the mists of time. On the other side here, we have another connection with history. That through the undergrowth there, which I'm not quite sure where it's going to be, Through the trees there um, was one of Scotland's uh, historical characters, William Wallace. He came here to hide in a cave, which is just over there, and there's also a little well which he used to use to um, wash and freshen up. And he came here while he was an outlaw to visit his mother, who stayed in Dunfermline. Um, I once I left the, the west coast, came through here, but he could just slide into the town because he was a, an outlaw. Well, was he a patriot? Was he an outlaw? I suppose that depends on which side of the border you're from. But uh, anyway, that's where he was, and he was hunted by the English soldiers in this area, but was never caught. But we still have the historical connections there. As you can see, <coughs> this is a double bridge. In actual fact, you, it could conceivably be a triple bridge because this line of the bridge is the original medieval way into Dunfermline from the west. There was no other way in from the west except this path. And then there was a small bridge built and then when Anne, that's James VI, his wife, she built the bridge just below here. And then in the 1700s, the then owner and laird of the Pitton Chief was George, Captain George Finn. And he raised the upper level and brought it along this way. The stone balustrades, these came along thanks to the Canadian Film and Trust once they started to, to manage and clean up the whole area. Um, so there's been several attempts at levelling this road. What I have noticed over the years, that the way up to the Abbey, the hill, there must be something you know, wrong with the hill because it keeps getting steeper. Or maybe that could just be me, I'm not sure. Come on then, we'll go up to King Malcolm's Tower. Please be mindful of the uh, handrail, and there isn't one. site of what was King Malcolm Canmore's tower. Um, it features greatly in the history of Dunfermline. <clears throat> it provides the, the centrepiece of the uh, coat of arms of Dunfermline, of a, a tower with two rampant lions at the side, and uh, an, an acknowledgement to, to the tower. I would not go so far as to say that these are the original stones. There has been massive works over the years. There are photographs around which show trees. Um, you're growing up here. But this is a significant thing is that this is where Dunfermline was born, as I said earlier on. As we go down the hill here, the steps, we'll 
go up and have a look at the Abbey of Dunfermline, where in fact Malcolm and Margaret were married in the year 1070. As I mentioned earlier, <coughs> there is an East Port Street in Dunfermline, there was a North Port and there was a West Port, but there never was a South Port. There was no specific entrance to Dunfermline from the south. But in actual fact, the path that leads down there comes from a lower level, and that was the path that people would come along and then walk up and join this road here and go up to the West Port. So we only ever had three entrances to Dunfermline. Just over to my right through the trees, <clears throat> and this is probably one of the best times of year to come and see it because there are no leaves. Um, you can see the, the ruins of St Catherine's Hospital and Alms House, which when pilgrims and people came into the infirmary from the west, they would come to the hospital here uh, before they went through the, the west port of the infirmary, the big gates. Sadly now, it's just a handful of stones, it's all filled up from inside, and it's not a very nice place to go to. But it gives you another perspective of Dunfermline. I think the whole place must have been a few feet lower in the days of the hospital, but over the years it's been built up and changed. And of course there's a good view there of uh, the present city chambers. It's our third set of uh, city chambers. The first one that was right at the, the legality house was right where we have Bridge Street now. But that, they, that was taken down in the 1700s for, uh, for putting in Bridge Street and also a new townhouse, which only lasted until about the 1850s or thereabouts when this new, beautiful um, French Gothic style of building was erected. The city fathers, they wanted to show off Dunfermline's position as in the economics and uh, showed how wealthy they are and, uh, well, the building worked. Here behind me is the west end of the Dunfermline Abbey nave. On the east end is the new parish church, when I say new, 1818-1820, which replaced the old um, original high altar, which was demolished during the Reformation. <clears throat> Two towers, but you can only see one today because in the 1700s and in this area, there were businesses and one um, Alexander Miller, I think his name was, who was the landlord of the public house just up the road there. Um, he kept his horses and his, for his, his stables here. Uh, one night there was a thunderstorm, lightning hit that, hit that tower and then it came, killed the horses and he went out of business. But it was rebuilt, not in the same style, but that's as far as it got. But again, it makes it quirky, it makes it um, just that wee bit different on the outline of Dunfermline. <clears throat> We're passing down my right hand side the, what was called the Palace of Dunfermline, which originally was part of the Abbey complex. This was the, the guest house of the, uh, the Abbey and the Abbot. 
But in the 1300s, a gentleman called King Robert the Bruce came along uh, with his wife Elizabeth and, um, shall we say, made an offer the abbot couldn't refuse. And Robert the Bruce turned this into the royal palace of Dunfermline. One or two royal families stayed there over the centuries, but the most significant one was James VI of Scotland, Mary Queen of Scots' son. And he came here and he lived with his uh, queen, Queen Anne. And <clears throat> like all good women, um, it wasn't quite big enough for her. So she said to, her, said to him, could you build me an extension, please? And up by one floor, these are a new set of bedrooms just along there. In the bedroom, just the third along from the left, um, was where some of the children were born. One in particular, um, King Charles the First, who obviously became king when they were down in London um, after James became James I of Great Britain. But also in the palace living was his older sister, um, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, she went off to marry the protector of Bohemia. Um, and they lived there successfully. And they had an offspring called Sophia. Sophia moved to the, the north of Germany. And she married into the house of Hanover. And one of her offspring was called George. And it was that George that was invited by the British government to come and become the first Hanoverian king of Great Britain. So we in Dunfermline can actually trace our present queen, Queen Elizabeth II. Her lineage starts here in Dunfermline. So, you know, like all these other lineages, it goes through various countries. Um, uh, but we, we are undoubtedly known as a royal Dunfermline. Behind us there is the, uh, the tower with King Robert the Bruce on it. <clears throat> Not part of the original plan, um, but it was only when Bruce's bones were discovered uh, during the excavations that they decided to put King Robert the Bruce and his body is actually interred below the pulpit in the, uh, in the abbey. So we do have some, some famous people who stay in and around Dunfermline. The, uh, the little path uh, down there actually leads up to the palace kitchens, which are just here. And up until a few years ago, it was still possible if you were digging amongst the undergrowth or in the earth to find such things as oyster shells, because this is where they were brought in and also once they were finished with, disposed of out into nature. We're nearly at Journey's End with Andrew Carnegie's cottage just over there. <clears throat> but there's another little famous person um, who lived in this area of Dunfermline in this rather nice little cottage here. <clears throat> and of course, that was none other, none other than me. <laughs> um, my father worked for the Carnegie Reform Trust for many, many years. 
and um, this was a trust property and we were you know, given it to stay in. As was number 103, just the next one up, that was the, the home of the then secretary and treasurer, um, Mr Jack Orison. But So by living here, I had unfettered entrance into the Glen. Yes, they've got these gates nowadays, and every night at eight o'clock, one of the staff from the Glen came round, locked the gates, and right around the whole place. But they could never stop me from going into the Glen, because I just keep out my back door and in there. Somehow I developed an awful lot of friends that we could play down there happily for years, for hours upon hours. But now the gates are open all the time. But uh, that house has got a, a special place in my life because that's really where I grew up. And with a neighbour like Andrew Carnegie, what is there not to like? And <clears throat> here we are at the the doorway into Andrew Carnegie's birthplace and museum. Um, generally open in the, the summer and winter and autumn months, but during the winter it does take a you know closing times. But this is where it all started for young Andrew. He used to play quite happily up until the years of twelve in this area. He never really went to school very much. He didn't go to school until he was about eight or nine in the Rowland Street uh, Lancastrian School, just across the way a piece. But he loved this area. There was nothing he would never do. He was just wanted hours of happiness. But the one thing he could not do that I can do, or I have done, is that I can go into the Glen at any time. Not so, Andrew Carnegie. The whole of Scottish history in Carnegie's minds was encapsulated in the Glen. His uncle, George Lauder, gave informal education to Carnegie and told him all the stories of William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, everything that flamed Carnegie's imagination. And I think that's where the Carnegie sense of adventure really was founded. And he went on to become the world's richest man in America, but he never ever forgot his own hometown. We've got a library, we've got a park, we've got so many things in Dunfermline. It is worth coming to Dunfermline just to see for yourself some of the great um, places that we have. Thank you very much for staying on this little walk. Um, dare I say a happy new year uh, 2021 and let's hope it gets a wee bit brighter than what we've had in 2020. So, but thank you very much for staying with this video.